The Task Force to Investigate Terrorism Financing will come to order. The title of today's task force hearing is A Dangerous Nexus, Terrorism, Crime, and Corruption. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recess of the task force at any time. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the Chair for inclusion in the record. Without objection, members of the full committee who are not members of the task force may participate in today's hearing for the purpose of making an opening statement and questioning the witness. The chair now recognizes himself for three minutes for an opening statement. I'd again like to thank Chairman Henserling and Ranking Member Waters for working to establish this important task force and reaffirming this committee's commitment to using its role to address the threat of terrorism, as well as my colleagues here today who will work to ensure its success. At our last hearing, we demonstrated the breadth and scope of terrorism throughout the world, as well as how these groups have evolved in the face of a strong American response. While the United States has seen some success in shutting these groups out of the international financial system, like squeezing a balloon, this has lent itself to the creation of more sophisticated and diverse funding avenues for these terror organizations. Terrorist groups have become entwined with transnational criminal syndicates, or in some cases evolving into the role themselves, engaging in criminal activities which yield greater profits than simply relying on state sponsorship or big pocket donors. These activities range from, but are not limited to, corruption, drug trafficking, human smuggling, and extortion. Place these funding methods on top of other non-traditional means discussed in our last hearing, and it's easy to see that today's terror organizations are often better financed than their predecessors even a decade ago. Today's terrorist groups and transnational criminal syndicates thrive in highly insecure regions of the world. Terror organizations contribute to the continued regional instability and internal conflict, while organized crime exploits these environments for financial gain and corruptive influence. To witness the impact of this dangerous union, the United States has to simply look to the tri-border area. This is relatively lawless region along the frontiers of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. It has become the base for Hezbollah's illicit activities to fund its terror operations in the Middle East and around the world. Hezbollah has engaged in several of the criminal activities mentioned, and though through them has succeeded in raising a substantial amount of money to bankroll their actions. In fact, according to 2009 Rand Corporation report, Hezbollah has netted around $20 million a year in this area alone. It is this type of connection, the intersection between terrorism, crime, and corruption, that today's hearing will focus on, including current techniques being used by these groups, effectiveness of the current U.S. policy in combating them, and where these tactics can be improved. Groups like Hezbollah, the Islamic State, and Boko Haram can no longer simply be considered terrorist groups. They've evolved into sophisticated global criminal conglomerates. In order to effectively combat such volatile threats, U.S. policy must evolve as well. That is the purpose for the formation of this bipartisan task force. And it's my hope that today's dialogue between our diverse group of members and the expert panel of witnesses joining us leads us to a better understanding of the challenges facing us and shapes our discussion of long-term solutions moving forward. This time, I'd like to recognize this task force's uh, ranking member and my colleague, Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Henseling and, and Ms. Waters for, for their work on this, as well as your own and, and Vice Chairman uh, Pittenger. And, and of course, our, our panelists this morning, thank you for helping the committee with its work. Today's task force on terrorism finance and hearing will examine the dangerous nexus between terrorism, crime, and corruption. This hearing is particularly timely. Uh, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, in, identified terrorism and transnational organized crime as among the top eight global threats to U.S. national security when he testified this past February before the U.S. Senate's Committee on Armed Services. According to Director Clapper, both terrorist and transnational criminal groups thrive in highly insecure regions of the world, with terrorist groups contributing to regional instability and internal conflict, conflict while transnational organized crime groups exploit these environments for financial gain and corruptive influence. One example of this can be found in Venezuela, 
Earlier this week, the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency and U.S. prosecutors in New York and Miami are investigating the multiple high-level Venezuelan government officials, including Venezuela's National Assembly President, on suspicion they have turned the country into, quote, a global hub for cocaine trafficking and money laundering. The investigations are a response to an explosion in drug trafficking in that oil-rich country, U U.S. officials say. I bring up the example of Venezuela because Douglas Farah's prepared remarks for today's hearing discuss how a block of countries led by Venezuela now operate jointly both as a political project uh, with an underlying goal of harming the United States and as a joint criminal enterprise. These countries are creating alliances across the globe with terrorist organizations, including Hezbollah, and the drug trade seems to be a huge source of the revenue propelling this. The U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign As Asset Control previously sanctioned corrupt Venezuelan government officials pursuant to the Foreign Narcotics Kingpin Designation Act for acting for, on, excuse me, for acting for or on behalf of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, uh, a, which is the narco terrorist organization, and that is often in direct support of its narcotics and arms trafficking activities. Furthermore, it's important to note that this crime, terrorism, corruption nexus may not only play out in Venezuela, but in other, other parts of the world. As reported by the State Department in its April 2014 country reports on terrorism, the tri-border region of South America that the chairman has just identified is reflective of the inter interrelationship between criminal activity, terrorism, and financing. According to the report, the tri-border area of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay continue to be an important regional nexus of arms, narcotics, and human trafficking, counterfeiting, pirated goods, and money laundering, all potential funding sources for terrorist organizations. I hope that this hearing will shed more light on the scope and pervasiveness of such threats. I look forward to hearing the testimony for our witnesses so we can examine these issues and potential solutions further. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy, and I yield the balance of my time. Next, I'd like to recognize the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Pittenger, for one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Hensling, for your leadership and vision establishing this task force, and for Ranking Member Waters and Chairman Fitzpatrick for your leadership and Mr. Lynch. I also really would like to thank the witnesses for joining us today. This will be a very important and, and very meaningful uh, hearing. Understanding the link between terrorism and crime is a vital step towards understanding the, what efforts we can take to deter terrorism financing. How are terrorists coordinating with drug lords and for what benefits? How are they working with transnational criminals to move money through the financial system? How are they utilizing the same smuggling routes today that have been used for years in the past? And what means have they, not, have they been previously not been, been utilized, like cyber warfare, should we be preparing for today? And the bigger question, what are we going to do to stop it? Knowing that we have ended the threat finance cell, there are strong concerns that we don't have the capabilities and the intelligence necessary to be effective in our goals. I also have concerns about the current effectiveness of intergovernmental cooperation to undermine the flow of money to terrorists. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses on these issues, continuing the task force effort to counter terrorist financing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Waters, for one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I applaud the bipartisan efforts surrounding this task force and believe it will serve us well as we work to guard against key threats to our national security. Today, the task force will explore a dangerous new trend, the growing convergence of terrorism and crime. While terrorist organizations motivated by ideology and criminal enterprises driven generally by greed, have generally been thought uh, to operate independent from one another. The testimony from our witnesses today makes it clear that this is no longer the norm. Furthermore, in an age of globalization, the growing convergence of terrorist and criminal groups means that illicit networks, once seen as a local or regional concern, now have global security implications. While a whole of government approach is necessarily ne it's certainly necessary to tackle these issues effectively. I'm hopeful that this task force can serve as a catalyst for action on these issues that fall squarely in our jurisdiction. 
In my view, a careful review of the deterrent value of our current anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing enforcement regime would be a good place to start. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair Nod recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be a member of this task force. My thanks to the leadership for its formation. I think it's important that we uh, focus on the transnational cr criminal organizations, that they're driven by profit, number one, and how they interact with foreign terrorist organizations are driven by ideology. You combine those two things, you've got a toxic soup. And we've seen many scary examples, as noted this morning, of the relationship between criminal activity and terrorist organizations that interconnect throughout the world. I'm looking forward this morning with our fine panel of witnesses to learning more about that and finding out how we can uh, interdict that process and stop it. I appreciate it, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Cinema, for one minute. Thank you, Chairman Fitzpatrick and Ranking Member Lynch. Terrorism is an undeniable threat to our country's security and global stability. Terrorist networks constantly develop new ways to finance their deadly operations and threaten America. Terrorists frequently leverage criminal networks for financing. To keep our country safe, we must be one step ahead of them, cutting off their funding and stopping their efforts. The Islamic State is one of the world's most violent, dangerous, and well-financed terrorist groups. In 2014, ISIL generated approximately $1 million per day, predominantly through the sale of smuggled oil. That's why I've recently offered an amendment accepted to the NDAA to direct the Secretary of Defense in coordination with the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Treasury to pursue efforts to shut down ISIL's oil revenues and report on resources needed for these efforts. ISIL also recently captured the famed archaeological sites at Palmyra, raising the possibility that they will destroy or sell priceless artifacts to fund their militant violence. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to keep money out of the hands of terrorists and find solutions that strengthen America's security. I yield back. We now welcome our witnesses. Selena Rialio is Professor of Practice at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University. Professor Rialio is a former U.S. diplomat, international banker with Goldman Sachs, U.S. foreign policy advisor under the Clinton and Bush administrations, and Professor of International Security Affairs at the National Defense, Georgetown, George Washington, and Joint Special Operations Universities. As the State Department Director of Counterterrorism Finance Programs, Professor Rialio managed a multi-million dollar foreign assistance program aimed at safeguarding financial systems against terrorist financing. Professor Rialio is a graduate of the Harvard Business School, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dr. David Asher is an adjunct senior fellow at the National Center for a New American Security and serves on the Board of Advisors of the Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Over the last decade, Dr. Asher has advised the leadership of SOCOM, CENTCOM, DEA, and the Departments of Defense, Treasury, State, and Justice on top counter threat finance priorities. Dr. Asher conceived of and spearheaded several of the highest profile anti-money laundering actions in history. From 2002 until 2005, Dr. Asher organized and ran the North Korea Illicit Activities Initiative for the National Security Council and the Department of State. Dr. Asher graduated from Cornell University and received his doctorate in international relations from the University of Oxford. Richard Barrett is a senior vice president at the Sufan Group and a fellow at the New American Foundation in Washington, the Royal United Services Institute in London, and the Center for Research and Security Studies in Islamabad. From March 2004 to December 2012, Mr. Barrett served as the coordinator of the Al-Qaeda and Taliban monitoring team at the United Nations in New York. In 2005, he helped establish what became the United Nations Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force following the adoption by the General Assembly of the Global Strategy to Counterterrorism in 2006. Before joining the United Nations, he worked for the British government both at home and overseas. Douglas Farah is currently president of IBI Consultants, LLC. He is also senior non-resident associate at the Americas Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies 
and Senior Fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. Mr. Farrer works as a consultant and subject matter expert on security challenges, terrorism, and transnational organized crime in Latin America. For the two decades before consulting, Farrer worked as a foreign correspondent and investigative reporter for the Washington Post, covering the civil wars in Central America, the drug wars in the Andean region, conflicts, and the illicit diamond trade in West Africa led by Charles Taylor, radical Islam, and terrorism financing. The witnesses will now be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of their testimony. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made a part of the record following their oral remarks. Once the witnesses have finished presenting their testimony, each member of the task force will have five minutes within which to ask their questions. On your table, for the witnesses, there are three lights. Green means go, yellow means you're running out of time, and red means stop. The microphone, we're told, is very sensitive, so please make sure that you're speaking directly into it. With that, Professor Rialio, you are now recognized for five minutes, and we thank you for your, for your attention here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the task force for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify on the dangerous nexus of terrorism, crime, and corruption that threatens U.S. national security at home and abroad. Illicit networks of terrorists, criminals, and their facilitators actively capitalize on weak governance, black markets, and corruption to challenge security and prosperity around the world. After examining the critical enablers of these networks, in particular financing, and illustrating the convergence of illicit networks in the case of ISIL, I will propose some specific measures to further leverage our financial instrument of national power to combat terrorism, crime, and corruption. Illicit networks threaten the four key missions of the nation state, to provide security, promote prosperity, safeguard the rule of law, and ensure that the government represents the will of the people. Illicit actors require critical enablers to realize their political and revenue objectives. They are leadership, personnel, illicit activities, logistics, communications, weapons, technology, corruption, and financing. Financing is the most vital enabler since money serves as the oxygen for any activity. Consequently, following the money trail is instrumental to detect, disrupt, and dismantle these networks. Since 9-11, the U.S. has countered terrorist financing through intelligence and law enforcement operations like the Iraq and Afghan threat finance cells, public designations and sanctions, and capacity building programs. As a result of these efforts, the Al-Qaeda operatives complained about a, lack, about a lack of funding for terrorist operations, and the Mexican cartels realized that they could no longer easily launder profits through banks. Tighter measures to combat the financing of terrorism and crime have also unexpectedly rooted out graft and corruption at the highest levels of government. Terrorism, crime, and corruption have existed since the dawn of time, but now they've gone global with record levels of profits and violence. In many cases, terrorists, cartels, and gangs are better armed and funded than the very government services, security forces responsible for confronting them. We are witnessing a dangerous convergence of terrorism and crime that threatens our national security. Convergence is the process of coming together and having one interest, purpose, or goal. Certain groups are demonstrating a hybrid terror crime behavior, such as the Haqqani Network in Afghanistan, the FARC in Colombia, Hezbollah, and ISIL. All eyes are now on ISIL with its brutal beheadings, military advances in Syria and Iraq, dramatic foreign fighter flows. It is an example of convergence with its ambitions for a caliphate and profit-seeking criminal activity. ISIL requires significant financing to realize its evil agenda and is considered the richest terrorist group in the world. As you all know, it derives much of its income from illegal oil sales with additional funding from extortion, kidnapping, stolen antiquities, human trafficking, and some donations from external individuals. One of the nine lines of effort of the U.S. strategy to counter ISIL is disrupting its finances. It's focused on disrupting its revenue streams, restricting its access to international financial systems, and targeting ISIL leaders and facilitators with sanctions. On the military front, Operation Inherent Resolve has conducted airstrikes against ISIL oil infrastructure and supply networks in Syria and Iraq. As of May 8, 152 targets have been damaged or destroyed, according to U.S. Central Command. This past weekend, U.S. Special Forces conducted a daring raid in Syria against Abu Sayyaf, a senior leader considered the chief financial officer of ISIL. 
This operation illustrates the growing importance of targeting ISIL's finances and how valuable the financial intelligence collected at the target site could be to attack its networks. To counter illicit networks, we need to further leverage the financial instrument of national power, and I propose the five following measures. Number one, increase resources to government agencies to investigate, prosecute, and, and, and prosecute terrorism, crime, and corruption. Number two, retain the Afghan threat finance cell and establish new ones to target emerging threats like ISIL. Number three, revitalize the interagency terrorist financing working group to coordinate all activities across agencies. Number four, dedicate a percentage of the fines from sanctions evasion and money laundering to directly support counter threat finance programs. And lastly, promote public-private partnerships to empower the private sector to serve as our eyes and ears to detect financial crimes. In conclusion, we must understand our illicit, the illicit networks that confront us and deny their access to critical enablers. Stemming the flow of funding to groups like ISIS and Hezbollah can neutralize their violent agendas. Only through comprehensive, proactive, interagency and international uh, strategies can we co effectively combat terrorism, crime, and corruption around the world. And the financial instrument of national power is a critical tool that we must take advantage of. Thank you for your time and attention. Dr. Asher, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Fitzpatrick, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Ittinger, uh, Congressman Lynch, uh, it's an honor to speak before you. I, I actually want to say thank you for giving a care about this issue. This is a very important issue. Uh, it's really not in the weeds. It's at the heart of the matter. Money is the sinew of war, and we are in a war against terrorists uh, around the world, uh, whether people want to admit it or not. I want to uh, highlight uh, an experience that I've had. I've been involved in nearly 25 years of working against terrorism financing, doing financial operations against drug cartels, adversarial governments, um, uh, weapons proliferation networks. I've sort of seen it all. But what I hadn't seen <laughs> until 2007 when I started to advise the Drug Enforcement Administration, which despite some raps recently is an awesome organization actually, it's done some incredible stuff for our national security, well above and beyond its remit. Uh, I hadn't seen uh, a, a case where the United States itself has become the largest money laundering vehicle for terrorism in the world. And that case is the case involving the Lebanese Canadian Bank a bank that was under the command control of Hezbollah, and most particularly the element within Hezbollah, it appears, and this is still uh, subject to being proven in court, uh, that's tied to terrorism, the Islamic Jihad organization that attacked our embassy twice in the 1980s and killed hundreds of Americans. Uh, um, that organization is known as the external security organization of Hezbollah, and it controls the external security apparatus of Hezbollah, which reaches all the way into the United States of America itself. Um, to garner profit and, and gain influence, they've engaged in something that I would call the criminal resistance, i.e., they've used the $80 billion U.S. dollarized Lebanese banking system, which is the third largest offshore financial center for dollars in the world, I believe, uh, uh, as a center point for their global money laundering empire. Um, uh, the United States has dozens of banks with correspondent relationships with, the, with Lebanon. Uh, the largest, uh, the fastest growing bank in Lebanon until three years ago was called the Lebanese Canadian Bank. That bank was under the control of Hezbollah. Um, uh, through DEA's Operation Titan, which I had the honor to advise on from 2007 onward, uh, the DEA was able to uh, use undercover informants uh, and other sources to penetrate. This is all in the public eye. I'm speaking totally based on unclassified information and from a personal viewpoint only. Um, this bank was engaged in buying primarily used cars in the United States and Europe and textiles in Asia as part of a massive money laundering scheme in partnership with La, with La Oficina de Envigado. That is the uh, outfit that Pablo Escobar himself set up in the 1980s and 90s to uh, uh, run the Medellin drug cartel. Um, this is all in OFAC uh, Treasury Department documents you can find on the web. So LCB was buying as much as a billion dollars a year in uh, used cars in the United States, uh, cars which were generating uh, almost no profit, actually, exporting the cars to West Africa, where the money was commingled with narcotics trafficking uh, proceeds coming out of Europe. This is the world, the world we live in. It's very complicated. Um, the drugs were, were flowing from Colombia primarily into Europe. Uh, the money was being couriered back to Lebanon, being wired to the United States to buy used cars here. Uh, as well as buying used cars in Europe with cash. 
And it was making its, money, its way back into the, the, this Lebanese Canadian bank, which was at the center of uh, Hezbollah's money laundering empire. So it's the largest material support scheme in the world, and it remains the largest material support scheme in the world for a terrorist group. In 2010, the DEA began constructing a, a takedown strategy against the Lebanese Canadian Bank that I helped advise on. Um, I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, I won't get into all the details. We uh, organized the designation of Lebanese Canadian Bank under Section 311 of the USA Patriot Act that cut it off from the United States. Blew up the bank. $5.5 billion Hezbollah Bank, bankrupt in three weeks. Thank you very much. So that was a success. We designated the drug kingpin from the Medellin drug cartel, Ayman Juma, who was in, at the center of this thing. He was uh, indicted in, this, in the Eastern District of uh, Virginia for laundering over a billion dollars a year uh, for Los Zetas. He's indicted uh, uh, for his relationship with Lebanese Canadian Bank and designated as well. Um, he's being want for, wanted for arrest. We went after the car parks in West Africa. We designated those. Never designated a car park before. before. It was a huge success. But I'm here to tell you that today, unfortunately, there are more cars being exported from the United States itself to, Lebanon, uh, to uh, West African car parks controlled by Hezbollah than there were when we made the designations in 2011 and 2012. Um, our policy is a great success of interagency cooperation, international cooperation. Uh, the, I feel very proud with this. Uh, the, the Bush administration and even this administration have done to try to, to make a dent to this. Unfortunately, it has not succeeded. Uh, I'd like to discuss with you some measures which might help advance that success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asher. Um, Mr. Barrett, you're now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Barrett, can you uh, turn your microphone on, please? Uh, I'm so sorry. Thanks. Okay. Um, Thank you, Chairman Fitzpatrick, Vice Chairman Pettinger, Ranking Member Lynch, distinguished members of the House Financial Services Committee. It's an honor to testify before you today on this issue of perennial concern. Uh, although terrorism, along with other forms of violent crime, lacks a profit motive, any terrorist attack costs money. And it's reasonable to assume, therefore, that the less money that a terrorist group has available, the less able it will be to mount an attack. And if it does so, limited finances should result in limited impact. But terrorism, of course, by its nature is asymmetric, and is asymmetric in all its aspects, including financially. And even a rel relatively cheap attack can have a devastating impact. For example, the last Al-Qaeda attack in a Western country occurred in my country. On 7th July 2005, four individuals associated with Al-Qaeda blew themselves up on the public transport system in London, killing 52 people. The official inquiry into the attack estimated that it had cost less than £8,000. That's about $13,000 or so. To quote from the report, the group appears to have raised the, ne the necessary cash by methods that would be extremely difficult to identify as related to terrorism or other serious criminality. Khan, he was one of the group, appears to have provided most of the funding. Having been in full-time employment for three years since university, he had a reasonable credit rating, multiple bank accounts, each with just a small amount deposited for a protracted period, credit cards, and a £10,000 personal loan. He defaulted on his personal loan repayments and was overdrawn on his accounts. So, very difficult to detect. But despite the low cost of that, atta uh, of that attack and the unremarkable financial activity associated with it, it had a devastating impact, of course, on the United Kingdom. Beyond the deaths, uh, the cost of the UK economy was estimated at £2 billion just in the rest of 2005 alone. And uh, the cost of the official inquiry itself, I might say, was put at 4.5 million pounds. So even an unsuccessful attack, which uh, might therefore cost even less, can have a huge impact. Just think of the costs resulting from another plot that originated in the United Kingdom, the 2006 plot to blow up seven airlines traveling to North America. The additional security checks imposed on airports as a result have cost billions of dollars. The point I'm trying to make is that terrorism does not have to be expensive to be effective, whether in its primary objective of making people afraid or in its secondary objective of forcing governments to react. 
A second point is that terrorists can fund their operations through legal means, quasi-legal means, and illegal means. Legal means might include donations or the self-financing of the London bombings. Quasi-legal means might include the raising of income through traditional uh, means by terrorist groups that control territory, taxing income, selling natural resources, and so on. Whereas illegal means, of course, might include kidnap for ransom and, or all the other things we've heard about. And it's my belief that although terrorists have few qualms about how they raise money, they don't have any preferred means. They do whatever is easiest and most effective. And they'll raise money according to opportunity, aiming all the while, of course, to minimize effort and risk while maximizing their returns. And this complicates countering the financing of terrorism, as the money used by terrorists is not necessarily criminally tainted before it is collected. Increasingly, terrorists are attracted to the less governed areas of the world where they can establish bases and control ter territory. And inevitably, too, these areas are ones that criminals use for their own uh, transshipments of drugs or other contraband and things like that. And to this extent, terrorists have established a closer relationship both with crime and with criminal gangs. Though in my view, they are more likely to take a cut from the criminal gangs than to join their rackets or compete with them. Terrorists and criminals who operate for profit are not natural bedfellows. Criminals see terrorists as dangerous both in themselves and also in that they are likely to bring attention from the authorities. An official might easily be bribed to allow conventional criminal activity, but is less likely to agree to turn a blind eye to terrorism. Likewise, terrorists are suspicious of criminals as people who have no sympathy with their cause and might well attack or betray them if they saw profit in doing so. So the point I wanted to make, Mr. Chairman, was that although there is undoubtedly an association between terrorism and criminality, it's not necessarily straightforward nor even universal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Farrer, you're recognized now for five minutes. Members of the task force, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify about the dangerous nexus among terrorism, crime, and corruption. I speak only for IBI consultants and myself, not on behalf of the institutions which I am affiliated with. I'm going to focus my remarks on Latin America, where we are seeing a convergence of these three factors in new and dangerous forms. The convergence of terrorism, transnational crime, and corruption are the core of what I believe is a significant strategic threat to the United States. I describe this emerging Tier 1 security priority as criminalized states, that is, states that actively use transnational organized crime as an instrument of, of statecraft, rely on the revenues from illicit uh, activities to fund themselves, and often overlap this protective mechanism with terrorist organizations. In our hemisphere, we're primarily seeing this in the network that emanates, I would argue, from Venezuela in the Western Hemisphere, where you have a political project, a joint political project among multiple nations whose underlying goal is harming the United States, as well as operating in a co-joined criminal enterprise. Rather than being pursued by law enforcement and intelligence services in these states in an effort to impede their activities, transnational organized criminal networks and protected terrorist groups are able to operate in more stable, secure environments, something that most businesses, both licit and illicit, crave. Rather than operating on the margins of the state or seeking to co-opt small pieces of the state machinery, these criminal, criminal groups in these states are able to concentrate uh, their efforts at, on, at the state on multiple levels. Within that stable environment, a host of new options become available, from the sale of weapons to the use of national aircraft registries, shipping registries, the easy use of banking structures, the use of national airlines and shipping lines to move large quantities of unregistered goods, and the acquisition of diplomatic passports and other identification forms. The threat originating in Venezuela is not confined to Venezuela. The late Hugo Chavez, acting in concert with his allies Rafael Correa in Ecuador, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner in Argentina, set out to redefine the political landscape in Latin America. Senior members of El Salvador's uh, current FMLN government are also allied with this movement. To a large degree, this movement self-describes as the Bolivarian Alliance has been successful. Unfortunately, what their policies have wrought internally are massive corruption, rising violence, a disdain for the rule of law, and the collapse of institutions. 
On the strategic level, this has brought new alliances with Iran and Hezbollah, Russian, Russia and Russian organized crime, China and Chinese organized crime, as well as Mexican drug cartels and Colombian criminal organizations. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, a designated terrorist organization by the United States and, Euro and European Union, as well as a major drug trafficking organization, is directly supported by the Bolivarian nations as a matter of state policy. Such a relationship between state and non-state actors provides numerous benefits to both. The FARC and Hezbollah gain access to the territory of Bolivarian nations without fear of reprisals. They gain access to identification documents and access to routes for exporting cocaine to the United States and Europe, while using the same routes to import large quantities of sophisticated weapons and communications equipment. In return, the Bolivarian governments offer state protection and reap the rewards of the financial benefits of the individuals as well as institutions derived from the cocaine trade. Iranian ba uh, Iran, whose banks have been largely barred from the Western financial system, benefit from the access to the international markets through Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivian financial institutions, which act as proxies by moving Iranian money as if it orig originated in their own unsanctioned banking structures. There is significant new evidence of the, of the criminalization of these states. The first is a recent investigation by Veja, a Brazilian magazine, showing that Venezuela, with the help of Argentina, actively tried to help Iran's nuclear program in violation of international sanctions. The Wall Street Journal, as mentioned earlier, has a long list of senior uh, uh, Venezuelan administration officials being investigated for drug trafficking. The recent book, El Boomerang Chavez, the Chavez Boomerang just released describes in detail the numerous eyewitness, uh, from numerous eyewitnesses cocaine dealings at the highest level of the Venezuelan government and their contacts with Hezbollah and FARC operatives in officially sanctioned meetings and at the highest level. And the, recently, uh, the recent designation by Banca de Andorra by FinCEN is a foreign financial institution of primary money laundering uh, control. All of these mechanisms allow for literally billions of dollars to slosh through states that are completely unaccounted for, both in, the, in their by legislative oversight or by any form of accounting. Understanding how these groups develop and how they relate to each other in the form, in form from, uh, from outside the region, particularly given the rapid pace with which they are expanding their control across the continent and across the hemisphere, make these, uh, I would argue, a tier one threat and something critical that we need to understand and something that we often don't look at in, in, the, in the underlying ideological uh, underpinnings of the movement. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we thank all the witnesses for their testimony today, and the Chair will now recognize himself for five minutes. At our first hearing of this task force, which was held last month, we had some testimony on the question of the Iraq-Afghanistan threat finance cell, and because that uh, was Mentioned again here today, Professor Realio's uh, testimony. I'll, I'll ask the question the professor perhaps can, if you could respond to it, and then I'd like to actually hear the response of uh, the thoughts of each of the, of the panel witnesses. And the question is whether or not a concept similar to the Iraq and Afghanistan threat finance cell, if replicated in Latin America, could that be an effective means to combat these terror, criminal, hybrid franchises that operate there? in Latin America? Well, one of the lessons learned, um, unfortunately, from our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan has been that interagency and, more importantly, collaborative fusion cells have been extremely effective, particularly when you're designing a list of targets and, more importantly, harvesting information that comes of a financial and economic nature to actually incorporate it within our broader set of understanding these adversaries. In terms of Latin America, it would depend on different groups. Um, also, more importantly, since a lot of the activities are drug um, trafficking related, as well as human trafficking related, we would have to try to figure out which of the agencies um, would be the most suited. So it's the concept of actually creating a task force. In the case of post 9-11, the joint terrorism task forces that were established by the FBI are a model that have been studied by many academics, such as myself as well as other ways to actually leverage the know-how and then more importantly the resources that each of the agencies bear, uh, brings to bear. One other one which we did not discuss today is a very effective one under U.S. Southern Command, which is the Joint, Ter um, Joint Interagency Task Force South. It's called Jayat of South, based in Key West, um, Florida. It actually is interagency with all the um, uniform services, but even more importantly, the intelligence and the law enforcement agencies represented there as well as liaison, full-time liaison officers from other countries. 
Their primary mission is countering illicit trafficking, which already reflects the way that they're changing the look of the, instead of it used to be just drug trafficking, they're actually encountering a lot of precursor chemicals as well as, sadly, alien smuggling um, going through there. So there's a better way of how we can use these lessons learned and then more importantly apply them to what we call emerging threats. Uh, Dr. Asher? Well, my experience at first, uh, Selena, is, uh, actually, is, is absolutely spot on. Uh, I, I do feel, though, that uh, you need almost like an untouchables type uh, approach to this stuff. I mean, you need a group of people that are in charge uh, to go after the money uh, and to have global authority to roam. The money goes global. Uh, you see more money being laundered for the Sinaloa drug cartel and Hezbollah today in China probably than anywhere else. Uh, but we also, as I noted in my testimony, have a massive amount of laundering, uh, laundering right through the United States, right through the purchase of used cars. We've designated this. We've identified it to banks. And guess what? People are still accepting billions of dollars a year in payments from places like Lebanon for buying used cars. They're going to West Africa. We need a law enforcement top-down task force approach. And the uh, law enforcement professionals and the prosecutors need to be held accountable for results. We've, we know, based on overt uh, evidence that's been presented in court, that this is going on. So why is it still happening? Uh, we also need an approach that, and so I think the task force approach that you're interested in is very important, but I don't think it just be regional. I think it needs to be almost like uh, threat specific. So Hezbollah, Al Qaeda. Why have we not applied the racketeering, uh, 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 the RICO charge against Al Qaeda? It's a racket. Terrorism is against the law, and the reason it would matter on a financing level is we could go after, through long-arm capabilities, all their assets all over the world. And we have more than enough countries in the world that uh, endorse terrorism as a national-level crime. Dr. Asher, on, on the issue of trade-based money laundering, which you talked about in your testimony, what's your assessment of current U.S. Uh, policy? Absolute interest and unfortunate ineffectiveness. And it's not for lack of effort. I mean, everybody I've worked with, I've had a great honor and pleasure to work with. There are great people in our government. There is awareness of these issues that we never had before. There is awareness that we should go after finance, the financial networks as a means to tackle the whole network. It's a revolution. I'm very proud of it. But it's not working. There's more Hezbollah money being garnered in the United States today than there was in 2011 when we did, took the action. So we have to look at charging strategies like RICO. You know, we, we need to approach these things more like organized criminal rackets than, we, than just terrorism. Terrorism almost honors these people. Uh, and uh, we need to impose our OFAC penalties with much greater impunity and cut our financial system off when necessary from threats. At this point, I'm going to recognize um, Ranking Member Mr. Lynch for five minutes. Uh, thank you. And again, I want to thank the witnesses. We've had a chance to read your testimony. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Dr. Asher, uh, for a while there, with the Lebanese Canadian Bank, we had great success using Section 311 uh, sanctions, identifying them as, you know, as, uh, as um, you know, primary money laundering concerns. And, and it was not just us, it was the financial community that saw them as toxic and everybody backed away. So it, it basically shot them out of the legitimate, uh, you know, banking system, uh, especially the United States. Uh, would this work if we expanded 311 to go after, say, uh, you know, the, the auto dealers in Benin or West, West Africa that are, that are operating? Uh, if, if we, you know, if we continue to use that 311 type mechanism, would that be enough to, to choke off some of this funding? Yeah, in my written testimony, I recommend that we need to look at imposing Section 311 against the actual uh, uh, nation of Benin. It can be done. Uh, it's a very extreme measure. I would propose it as a very temporary measure. I don't want to obliterate the economy of a West African state that's growing very fast. But their fastest growing area is used cars coming from the United States that are going to uh, provide a material support for a terrorist organization. So, right. you know, I mean, of course we should be, you know, we have Section 311, which is a regulation, okay, uh, and it can be lifted very easily. Uh, uh, to protect our nation's financial system against money laundering. There's more de most definitely massive money laundering going on here. And most definitely, it's going to a terrorist organization. Right. And moreover, it's going to the military wing, uh, we believe, of the terrorist organization, the one that has killed hundreds of American citizens um, in the past and is engaged in activities against their interests right now in the Middle East. 
I mean, uh, we don't have these laws in the books for nothing. Now, I don't, uh, I, but I do believe an enforcement approach is also critical. We can't just impose sanctions and penalties and let the, force the banks to be the uh, enforcers of the law. We really need law enforcement to get into gear and to build financial cases against these complex conspiracies. They are very complicated. They are very yeah. hard to uh, prosecute, but they can be done. So I, I support, support a hybrid approach. But at the end no, of the day, the let, me, let me stop you there. I have another question. Uh, I don't want to use all my time. We have got, an, we've got, a, uh, we, we've got a, a problem coming up, which is uh, the, the agreement that the, the administration is trying to pursue with uh, Iran. Uh, we, have, we have sanctions against uh, Iran and uh, a number of uh, banks that had previously worked with them on uh, nonproliferation issues. And uh, those, are, those are major sanctions, the Iran uh, Sanction Act, the Iran-Syrian Sanction Act. And the President is negotiating, taking away those sanctions, dropping those sanctions in return for assurances and verification that, that Iran is no longer pursuing a, a, a military, not actively pursuing a military uh, you know, nuclear program. On the other hand, we also have a whole set of sanctions that are based on the work that you have been doing, which is uh, Iran has also been financing Hezbollah, uh, Islamic Jihad. They, even, according to Juan Zarate's book, uh, they even gave money to uh, Al Qaeda. So uh, those activities, if, if we are to drop the sanctions and allow their economy to, to grow, uh, what is to stop, what's to stop them to con from continuing that activity with respect to some of the work that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard is, is perpetrating, which is directly uh, supportive of some of this, uh, you know, illicit activity, the, the, uh, the criminal activity that is happening in, in so many other countries. Moral and human outrage if those laws are rescinded. Yeah. Okay? I mean, at the end of the day, the, the terrorism record stands. Uh, you know, for those of us that worked in, in the war in Iraq, we had more involvement uh, in EFP and other uh, IED-related attacks from Iran than almost any, certainly any other nation state. Um, you know, I was the senior advisor to the United States government for the Six Party Talks in North Korea. I know what multilateral nuclear diplomacy looks like. I also worked on the dark side to go after their finances in North Korea. I understand, you know, we have to have a hybrid approach sometimes to, in, in nuclear counterproliferation. But on terrorism, we have to draw the line. Right. And so it's your understanding that those, those sanctions, 311, things like that, that are, 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 that are uh, targeted towards the criminal activity that have been enforced by banks. These banks are, don't want to do uh, business with any uh, bank that's doing business with Iran because of the uh, criminal activity. Those should remain, right? Those should not be part of the... The terrorism uh, record stands. Right. Okay. The Chair now recognizes the uh, Vice Chairman of the Task Force, Mr. Pittenger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Asher, last March um, I asked Secretary Liu about the effectiveness of our intergovernmental uh, communication and coordination as it relates to stopping the financing of terrorism, specifically uh, U.S. Customs and their full access of data with limited access by FinCEN. Do you believe that we should be looking more seriously in, in better coordination, particularly as it relates to trade-based um, financing? Uh, could, should we be looking and targeting this type of, of better cooperation? Dominate all the uh, questions here, but I, I absolutely, first, U.S. Customs is an awesome organization. Everyone deserves their, uh, to take a look at what they do. They mm -hmm. uh, don't get nearly enough credit. I've been so impressed by their. Uh, data systems and the, the ability, they have probably stopped more terrorism than any other organization, including the CIA, however, and the FBI. However, uh, sharing data is very important. They are very good at receiving data. I think the ability to take some of their data and use it, for example, in organizations like FinCEN would be very uh, uh, proper and, 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 and to the greater good, because so much of the trade-based money laundering is going on in a way that is very difficult to measure. And one of the only ways to measure it is through things like bills of lading, these customs receipts that occur when you uh, export something. And so to the extent that those data systems aren't linked together, it holds us back in enforcing the law against these trade-based schemes. And trade-based money laundering is where it is at today for money laundering writ large. Yes, sir. 
you mentioned Section 311 and how effective that was with the Lebanese Canadian Bank. And of course, we saw how important it was in the Bank of Macau as it related to North Korea and other instances. Do you believe that, th that this is a central focus that we should as well have in terms of, of trying to uh, um, force some of these institutions um, to not be able to exist utilizing 311? Do you think that there's other institutions out there that cl clearly were in an unclassified briefing, but um, should that be a focus of our efforts? Yeah, I mean, it's the most powerful lever we've ever developed in financial uh, uh, warfare uh, against uh, uh, adversaries. And, and, and it's something that uh, needs to be utilized, uh, uh, you know, not every day, but periodically. It's, it's an incredible coercive tool. Uh, and uh, nothing like cutting someone off from the United States financial system, which is, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not our job to offer uh, access to uh, terrorism, terrorist groups and criminals to the, our financial system. When we see it happening, we should be allowed to cut it off, and uh, it, 311 offers that opportunity. Mr. Barrett, uh, in your testimony, you talked about smuggling and the link between terrorism and crime in some measure. Could you briefly compare ISIS oil smuggling and the smuggling used by Saddam Hussein to evade the UN oil for food program, and my sense is that ISIS is using the same routes and mechanisms and perhaps the same people, uh, but the U.S. and our allies haven't succeeded in stopping this. What haven't we been able to deal with this the second time around, and what should we be doing to stop it? Well, it's an interesting question, Vice Chairman. Um, of course, the oil for food program was a huge agreement by the international community through the Security Council in 1991 with Saddam Hussein, as you said, with the government, and did allow a certain amount of export of, of oil in order to be able to allow the Iraqi government to feed its people. Um, and that was open to many abuses, and it was indeed abused. But the scale on which Saddam Hussein was operating as a government, of course, is very different from the scale on which the Islamic State is able to operate, whereas Saddam Hussein, I think over the 12 or 13 years of the um, uh, oil for food program probably sold about $50 billion worth of oil. Of course, the Islamic State is selling perhaps now up to $2 million a week, so $100 million a year. Um, and also, <clears throat> whereas the export of oil under Saddam Hussein was authorized and therefore done in a regular way, in the Islamic State it's done very much in small scales out of sort of almost homegrown refineries into trucks which may take it into Turkey, may take it into Kurdish areas, may even sell it to the Syrian government, or most of it, in fact, is probably sold and consumed within the area controlled by the Islamic State itself. <clears throat> so this makes it very much harder for outside powers to control that, possibly Turkey, but generally speaking, it's difficult. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Professor Realio, um, as relate, you, you mentioned some about the uh, transport of, and the sale of, illicit sale of oil going out of uh, uh, Iran into, uh, through Turkey. Have we been effective at all in trying to minimize that, and what else could we be doing? So there's a decision specifically to target the oil infrastructure through the military campaign that I described in my testimony. And there has been damage done. But the bigger problem is that we cannot actually outright destroy the actual supply routes that feed the regular illicit economy, as well as the movement of people who are actually the innocents, who are in the, basically in the way of a lot of the ISIL. A lot of the um, market is actually driven by more localized consumption. So I've been asked a lot, having worked on Wall Street, more importantly, looking at oil markets. It's not actually, this oil is not entering global OPEC markets. It's actually a question of how to stem the demand locally. A lot of it is crossing into Turkey, um, which is disturbing. But more importantly, it's driven by those who are daily looking for a cheaper um, gallon of gasoline. Gentlemen, gentlemen's mm -hmm. time has expired. Thank you. Correction, Iraq uh, through uh, Turkey. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, you know, continue discussion about uh, money laundering. And I'm interested in pursuing uh, information on closing anti-money laundering loopholes uh, for persons involved in uh, real estate closings. Um, and this is, uh, I suppose, uh, a question for Mrs. Riello. 
An investigation recently conducted by the New York Times revealed the ease by which anonymous foreign billionaires <coughs> can purchase luxury real estate in the United States with few questions asked. In fact, nearly half of the most expensive residential properties in the United States <coughs> are now purchased anonymously through shell companies. One of the reasons few questions are asked about a buyer's identity is because FinCEN has exempted persons involved in real estate settlement and closings from having to ask basic questions as part of maintaining an anti-money laundering compliance program in accordance with the Bank Secrecy Act. The Patriot Act allows FinCEN to temporarily exempt certain entities from the requirement to establish anti-money laundering programs. One of the exemptions was persons involved in real estate closings and settlements. Do you believe that large cash purchases of luxury real estate by anonymous buyers could pose money laundering risks that need to be addressed? So that's always been a question in terms of what we call covered institutions. Since basically the wake of 9-11, the idea that other businesses, including real estate, could be used to launder money as well as move funds that are of illicit nature. We have under the banking system, you're very well aware of the know your customer practice. So there have been moves afoot, not just in the United States, but around the world, to actually try to enforce a broadening of the coverage of who would be required to know your customer and, more importantly, taking a look at things such as real estate. I do a lot of work in Mexico where this is a huge issue of the cartels actually buying uh, at businesses, but more importantly, real estate. And now there is a move afoot there for notary publics who are critical in order to actually transact the purchase or the sale, to actually also be required to do reporting and due diligence um, on their clients. And it's something that we might be able to consider here in terms of the U.S. as well. A lot of the flows of the money, um, particularly in real estate here in the U.S. by foreigners, is also suspect of tax evasion of their home jurisdictions, which is something that um, we should also be concerned about, uh, particularly if that money is coming from corrupt governments abroad who are coming to seek financial safe haven within the United States markets. Uh, uh, several years ago, um, I became interested in um, money laundering because we discovered that uh, one of our national banks had purchased a lot of the small banks in Mexico that were known to uh, launder drug money. And so in taking a look at that, we discovered that our banks were not following any know your customer policy. I don't even think they had a registration on hand for one of the officials at that time, I think it was the brother of one of the presidents of Mexico, who had large sums of money in this bank. Uh, and of course, the same thing was true with the Abachi brothers uh, from uh, Nigeria, who had uh, all of their money in our, our banks. And while, of course, I'm interested in this real estate aspect of it, you did mention, you brought up, you know, know your customer problems uh, with our banks. And I think that given that the statute uh, that I referenced allowed only temporary exemptions. Do you believe it's time that those involved in these type of real estate transactions should be required to implement U.S. anti-money laundering programs? Yes, and that's actually what we're trying to take a look at now. As financial innovations and new ways of moving and potentially laundering money or financing terrorism evolve, things such as the virtual world, we need to think about legislation that keeps up with these financial innovations in order to preclude dirty money from entering the U.S. system. Um, thank you very much for your interest on this topic. But anything that moves in terms of hiding money, um, the criminals and terrorists are very good at trying to circumvent um, our measures. Uh, thank you. And I suppose you are aware of the extensive article that was done about the Time Warner Center uh, and it's absolutely startling uh, to take a look at the purchase of those properties and who's buying them um, and how it all operates. So I think that this, uh, this information is uh, very um, instructive uh, and it certainly should cause us to want to take a closer look at what we do about this kind of, these kind of real estate transactions. Thank you very much. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I've got two questions. First one to uh, you, Mr. Farrar, and the second to Dr. Asher. Uh, in your testimony uh, uh, this morning, you spoke about how countries like Iran, whose banks are largely barred from the Western financial systems, 
have been able to gain access to international markets through countries like uh, or in, in Latin America. Would you help this committee further understand what implications uh, terrorist or criminal groups who are supported or allowed to operate in Latin America have on this country? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. I think that you, if you look at the, the way Iran has penetrated the, the financial systems of the Bolivarian states, particularly where I've documented it is in Venezuela and, and Ecuador, <coughs> excuse me, where you have um, Iranian banks setting up fa under false flag banks and operating as Venezuelan banks, or in the case of Ecuador, where the president of Ecuador authorized a small state-owned bank to become a channel for Iranian money and authorized it explicitly, and they were going to have their, um, their communications encrypted, and the encryption key for the financial communications was going to be held in the Iranian embassy. That's a little unusual, I would say, for uh, a normal banking structure. And I think that what the, the problem is in this setting is that when you have a state sanctioning those activities, no one's going to investigate them and no one's going to move uh, further down the road. And that, and that goes to the point of the absolute impunity that the state cover provides. So once you have a state that is willing to use either transnational organized criminal organizations or terrorist groups or both as part of their state sanctioned policy as opposed to what we see perhaps in Mexico where what do the narcos want? They want a judge who won't condemn them. They want a border guard who will let them cross. They want a policeman who will let their things go by. What these guys, what the, what the new construct in Latin America is entirely state protected and state driven. And I think that that, that is a fundamental sh uh, shift and I think that that opens the door for what you see Hezbollah doing in the region, what you see Iran doing in the region, what you see ETA from Spain doing in the region, which is having unfettered access access to financial institutions in ways that would not be possible without direct state participation. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Dr. Asher, uh, let me visit with you real quick, uh, go back to the used car uh, situation. Uh, what was the number you said the used cars were going out of this country? Was it a billion dollars? Well, just to Benin alone, it may be as much as a billion dollars. Okay. So my question is, where and who? are buying these cars, I mean, where are they buying them in auctions, where are they buying them from dealers, they buy them from individuals, where, where are these cars being purchased? They're buying them in auctions, typically. The money's coming out of Lebanon. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, thousands and thousands of people. I think that the customs, uh, CBP has probably denied thousands of visas for, for people from Lebanon. It's an unfortunate thing for a relationship with Lebanon, but there are people coming here who are being told, go buy cars, and they just do it. They, you know, they're going to get a big cut on the payment because it's drug money. Uh, there's a profit associated with it, so they don't really care how much money is being made on the car transaction itself. They just want the car, because without the car, they can't launder the money. So they buy them. You know, you see a lot of car lots just in the state of Virginia or in Baltimore. Uh, um, um, you go there and you see all these cars sitting there, and you never see anyone in the car lot. Ask yourself, who's running the racket? They, they, say, they season these cars on these lots, they sit there for a few days, and then they're off on a row row boat off to West Africa to car lots owned by Hezbollah. Now, did you say that the cars are buying around the twenty-five hundred dollar? I mean, is, or do they have there are a, a lot of cars or? that are below the, they're buying that are below the twenty-five hundred dollar customs mm -hmm. threshold, so they uh, don't come into our statistical database. It's sort of interesting. They know our laws better than we. So do. they're beating the system. They know how to beat the system. They know how to beat the system. These guys are they're they're, they're really brilliant, actually. And then again, and they're being and how are they being paid for cash? I mean, with the auction. Uh, no, they they typically uh, it's wire transfers. So okay. the banks are involved, you know, and right. uh, this is an issue. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to blame our bankers. Our bankers are trying very hard to enforce any money laundering and probably are given hugely onerous responsibilities to do so. Um, what we need to do is we need to target the Lebanese who are sending the money, and we need to say that this typology, which is subject to Section 311 of the USA Patriot Act is a money laundering typology for terror, and it shall be banned until it can be proven otherwise uh, in, not involved with terrorism. And then you've said this, but again, tell us, and so they get these cars, how are they being used? They're being driven around Nigeria perfectly licitly by, you know, relatively poor people who want a cheap car. I mean, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with the cars themselves. What's wrong is that they're buying them uh, as part of a money laundering scheme. Well, th I'm in the car business is the reason I'm asking, and I want to talk to you later, okay? Uh, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. Um, much of our U.S. government is doing an outstanding job. Some agencies aren't. Um, I've got an example that may beat the ones of our witnesses. 
an example where giving money to terrorists is not only easy, it's tax deductible. In 2009, I brought to the attention of the IRS that an organization called the IFCO, which was a 501c3 organization, out on its website, give us the money and we'll give it to Viva Palestinia, and then Viva Palestinia will give it to Hamas. It took them four years to take it seriously. Then in October 2013, the organization put on its website the IRS report as to why the organization should lose its tax-exempt status and used it as a fundraising device, saying, look, the IRS doesn't like us. Give us more money. We'll get it to Hamas. And even today, somebody who looks at the list of organizations to which they can give tax-exempt contributions can give it to the IFCO. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, just the fact that we make it a little easy for the terrorists, I got you beat. We make it tax deductible. Um, remittances. A lot of ordinary Americans want to send money to Somalia to their relatives. Um, would it make sense for the United States to green list licensed organizations where you know if you give them the money, the money will go uh, to an individual Somali relative? Now, of course, there's always the possibility that your relative has been seduced by terrorist propaganda and gives some of the money to terrorists, but at least that the money gets to uh, the relative of an American. Does it make sense for the United States government uh, to uh, uh, give Americans a, a, an avenue where they can feel relatively safe? Do we have a witness that wants to answer that, Mr. Bar uh, Barrett? Barrett. Uh, can I uh, address that? Yeah. Um, well, Somalia is a very good example. I mean, s s many, many Somalis rely on remittances to feed their families and to keep going. So it's an, it's an essential area of income for them. And of course, in Somalia, there aren't operating banks, and so many of these remittances are made through hawalidas and so on, informal systems. And you noticed the other day that after the Rissa attacks in Kenya, the Kenyan government wanted to shut down some of these remittance services because they reckoned they were also funding terrorism. But of course there was a huge outcry internationally because it would mean so many Somalis were disadvantaged. So I think that your question is absolutely right. I mean, what needs to be done is to be able to bring these informal systems into a more formal structure rather than banning them and trying to push them out. And one of the problems that we face now is that formal banks are very unwilling to to offer banking services to her walladers because they fear the regulations and so on. Thank you. Well, I want to move on to another issue, ISIS and, uh, and the Iraqi government. One of the best uh, ways ISIS has financed itself, or most successful ways, is seizing a lot of currency. What various countries have done is they've issued new currency, replacing old banknotes with new banknotes. This is incredibly inconvenient for criminals and corrupt politicians, say in Baghdad, just as it would invalidate the uh, banknotes stolen uh, at, the, uh, at the Mosul Regional Bank by, by ISIS. Uh, first, does anyone here have a good estimate as to the uh, value of the banknotes uh, seized by ISIS? Um, I've heard, had various reports. I don't see anybody. It, it so I, I think it's very hard to, to say. I mean, the, in Mosul, they were alleged to have stolen $500 million mm -hmm. worth, but, you know, whether that was in gold or in banknotes or whatever. You, would, you would hope that the Iraqi government would at least know the gold and currency it had in its bank before its American armed troops to, turned tail and ran and left the money for ISIS. But it goes beyond that. Um, the government... Um, is paying salaries to bureaucrats in Mosul, and that money is freely ta uh, taken by ISIS. It's my understanding, and I'd like, uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Barrett if, or any other witness, that the Iraqi government is sending electricity into Mosul uh, free, and then ISIS gets to collect from the utility users. Um, and I get conflicting arguments uh, or propaganda, well, I won't use the word propaganda, spin from our government. Half the time, 
uh, our government, the Iraqi government, are boasting that they are undermining ISIS's support by making it impossible for ISIS to provide good governance. And the other half of the time, they are saying we care about the people governed by ISIS and want to make sure their lives are comfortable. Um, uh, finally, there is the oil uh, that the professor uh, spoke about, the oil wells. It is hard to uh, we can bomb the oil wells. Have we chosen to not do that because we want to make sure that Mosul mo motorists are not inconvenienced? So more importantly, the bigger question is, after you bomb the oil wells, whoever is going to hopefully take back that territory in a legal manner, this is the bigger question of infrastructure, right, in terms of that's actually the question they have been targeting mostly the mobile refineries, because you are taking a look at the supply chain, just like any business in terms uh, of Professor, I know we are bombing the mobile refineries. I asked about bombing the oil wells. We didn't hesitate to bomb factories in France in 1941 and 1942 when we were serious. I yield back. Chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Palakwan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thank you all very much for being here today. Um, in dealing with this, uh, this, uh, this new dimension of terrorism financing. Um, I, uh, I encourage everybody to continue to do your, your good work to make sure our country stays on offense and, and make sure we do everything humanly possible to stop the flow of funds to terrorist groups that, that threaten our homeland. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned today as we go down this path and now all of a sudden we see a marriage between organized crime and terrorism. <clears throat> and so it's an additional source of funding to terrorism. Um, and I know all of us in this country are getting increasingly alarmed by uh, the, uh, uh, the savagery that we see over in the Middle East in particular, dealing with these organizations. I'd like to follow up with you, Professor Riala, if I can, with Mr. Lynch's question uh, dealing with, uh, with the administration's negotiations currently uh, with respect to a, a nuclear deal with Iran. And if, in fact, sanctions are lifted that are currently imposed on Iran, freeing up roughly $125, $150 billion of cash to that country. What might that do with respect to the increased marriage between organized crime and terrorist funding? And in particular, <clears throat> could you walk us through to the best of your knowledge, knowing that you have a background in international banking and also national security, um, what would happen next? So one of the concerns that several of us who are looking at different scenarios of how the Iran nuclear deal might turn out, one of the objections that several who are quite, uh, I say, proponents of the sanctions regime, the sanctions brought the Iranians to the negotiating table. That is clear. More importantly, the uh, Iranian economy is so suffocated now because of the sanctions. One of the scenarios that the Iranians would like is immediately upon signature of the agreement that there would be an automatic lifting of the sanctions. And it is very hard to put back in place the genie that is out of the bottle. The bigger issue, too, is you have now a global sanctions regime. And you know the U.S. issues sanctions as well as the EU and other countries, and then more importantly, at an international level. Once you actually have countries who are hoping to do business with Iran, not necessarily the United States, see the opening of the lifting of the sanctions, it will be very hard to actually apply what are these so-called snapback sanctions. Um, more importantly, you will see that they will be able to enter into the global economy, licitly as well as illicitly. And as we all know, um, Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism, as declared by the State Department, but more importantly is one of the, basically the godfather and patron of Hezbollah, which we, hasn't raised, uh, we haven't raised today, um, is actually supplying the foreign fighters for the Assad regime um, in Syria. It is so complex and convoluted, but if we take a look at it from an economic point of view, other countries who would like to do trade with Iran or more importantly get access to the oil that Iran produces, once you lift the punitive measures of the sanctions, it will be very, very hard to backtrack and reimpose them. Let us drill down, Professor, a little bit more if we, if we can, please. Mm -hmm. um, assuming those sanctions were to be lifted, and as you stated, Iran is a, is a sponsor of terrorism throughout the Middle East, whether it be Syria or Somalia or, or Yemen. Um, what would be the mechanics? What would we see if you were involved uh, in the international banking community with respect to how the lifting of those sanctions might facilitate organized crime interconnecting with terrorism activities and how might 
the Iranian regime be involved in uh, specifically to facilitate that? So more importantly, we would actually lift first the financial sanctions, which means that Iran would be able to bank globally, which is perhaps the most painful of the sanctions piece. More importantly, if we take a look at it from a physical trade piece, their ability to actually think about importing or exporting components that are perhaps could be used for other nuclear aspirations. In terms of a bank itself, we all, and when I was working at Goldman Sachs, did a ton of compliance, and more importantly, there are several who are anticipating, not necessarily U.S. institutions, but other global financial actors who are going to see this and seize the opportunity to increase their physical ability to access Iran. Once Iran actually also lines its coffers with more money, they'll be able to use that money, particularly since there's not a little bit of difference between the state and the private sector the way we have it here in the United States. And that's the thing that we fear. And Doug Farr and I spent a lot of time taking a look at how Iran and its, um, let's say, actors in the region in Latin America could also destabilize other parts of the world with its nefarious agenda. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody being here. And let's stay on offense. Thank you. You'll back my time. Thank you, sir. Gentleman yields back. Now recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for appearing as well. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very much concerned about the uh, notion that we should follow the money, uh, but I'm also concerned about following the counterfeit money, uh, what's called super notes. Uh, these, uh, this currency is so finely tuned that sometimes it's very difficult to be detected but for some sort of uh, special technology. Uh, as you know, the dollar is the reserve currency for most of the world, and uh, there is a war for currency supremacy. My concern, or maybe I shouldn't be, and I'll let you tell me, is whether or not these super notes uh, flowing in and out of our country and into other countries can pose some sort of threat to security in this country in the long run. I do understand that we retooled our currency, but I'm still concerned about nationals, nationals, uh, nationals, uh, large, uh, larger than terrorist organizations, countries, if you will, that can play a role in um, devaluing and creating mistrust in our currency. Does anyone care to respond? You know, having overseen the uh, multi-year initiative for the U.S. government against uh, North Korea's illicit financial networks, including Supernote, uh, I guess I can comment. Uh, it is a, um, it, it's been a very costly endeavor for the U.S. We've had to redesign our currency twice as a result of North Korea's uh, national level counterfeiting of our currency. Um, uh, I do not know that they have succeeded at counterfeiting the latest iteration of the $50 and $100 bills, though. Um, so, you know, Congressman, I definitely appreciate your interest in this and concern. It is a concerning issue. It's cost us hundreds of millions of dollars to redesign the currency over the years. Uh, so, and North Korea did uh, spur on uh, several huge bank runs overseas. In Taiwan, I think we had over $500 million uh, in bank runs in just a period of a couple weeks back in 2003 or 2004. Um, you know, so th the amount of money that the regime in North Korea has actually garnered from super note circulation is, is probably not as high as some people think, but the damage they've done is considerable. And the damage they could do, and, and if they can indeed uh, counterfeit the security features on the new notes, it would be, well, first it would be pretty incredible technologically, but they've been pretty good up to now. They've managed to do it uh, four different times, I believe, with notes. So, um, uh, and, and, and we know that they're essentially printing their notes and our notes that they're making, their version of our notes, on their printing presses. So. Um, you know, North Korea is using its absolute best capabilities here. So it's a concern. Um, uh, I think that the Department of Treasury is, is very much on top of it. But the bigger issue is why didn't North Korea get it prosecuted when we investigated them? Uh, the State Department played a very big role supporting Department of Justice. FBI had an incredible investigation into North Korea's uh, super note activity, including its ties to the official IRA and its ties to uh, Japanese terrorist groups and uh, from the 1970s and you know it was just wild stuff it, you know featured in Vanity Fair and Wall Street Journal articles and things and 
uh, President Bush, who I had the honor to serve, decided that it was too controversial and we couldn't uh, press charges against the Kim regime at the same time we were negotiating with them. And uh, of course, I was negotiating with them and I was involved in trying to press charges against them at the same time. I didn't understand the, 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 the reason not to do that. Um, the North Koreans know damn well what they were doing. Uh, and somebody needed to be held accountable. Uh, uh, but we didn't do it. Um, that evidence still exists. In theory, somebody could make a case. Uh, the statute of limitations probably doesn't expire against a state sponsor of terrorism, if we, at least it was at the time. So, you know. Mr. Asher, if I may, I, I appreciate your answer. I do want to interrupt for this reason. I have one other question for you. Uh, this one relates to knockoffs. I want to move to a more pedestrian level now, if I may. Uh, knockoffs. Uh, we see a lot of it on the streets. And the question is, to what extent are these knockoffs related to either uh, networks of criminal activity, not just as individual, but networks, and also the possibility of being linked to terrorism? Uh, you talked about cars. Yeah, the largest export for North Korea, believe it or not, is counterfeit cigarettes coming out of North Korean government-controlled, criminally run uh, uh, factories. Uh, uh, they're making maybe as much as 700 to a billion dollars a year in revenue on these, and we have them trafficked all over the United States. Frequently they appear in the press as coming out of China, but they're actually just coming through China because North Korea doesn't export directly to the United States particularly. So, you know, is it benefiting the regime? Absolutely. Is it benefiting the most despicable, dangerous elements of the regime? Absolutely. Are they tied into transnational organized crime? 100 percent certain. And we've proven it in court repeatedly. So you should be concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. I yield back. Chair now recognizes my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Farrow, you point out in your testimony that Iran, whose banks are largely barred from the Western financial system, benefits from access to the international financial market through Venezuela, Ecuador and Bolivian financial institutions, which act as proxies by moving Iranian money as if it originated in their own unsanctioned financial systems. Can you explain on a practical level how Iran was able to use these institutions to evade international sanctions regimes and what the U.S. has tried to do, clearly unsuccessfully, to, pre to prevent this? Uh, thank you, sir. The, there are two specific cases that I can go into some detail. Uh, one is the Banco Internacional de Desarrollo in Venezuela, which was set up as a Venezuelan bank, but all of its directors were uh, Iranian. And it was eventually when I and some others dug up the initial documents showing that, in fact, the directorships were all Iranian citizens and it was operating as a subsidiary of, in fact, as a subsidiary of an Iranian bank, not as a Venezuelan bank, as the Venezuelan government had claimed. Uh, OFAC eventually, uh, the Treasury Department sanctioned them, and they are now functioning, but at a much smaller level than they were. Uh, before, but they still have the, the Iranian influence. The other case is the case of Kofiak Bank in uh, Ecuador, where we were able to get the records, uh, some uh, investigative journalists in the, in the region, and then I was able to supplement it with some other stuff. Uh, got the records of the meeting between President Rafael Correa and President Ahmadinejad in February 2012. Where pres and, and President Correa eventually acknowledged that these documents were legitimate, so we don't have the, the debate over whether this was real or not. Ahmadinejad asked President Correa for a bank. President Correa says, oh, I have a bank for you, Kofiak Bank, which was a national bank uh, that was virtually non-functional at the time, but still existed as a bank, so they didn't have to register a new bank. After they reached that agreement, President Correa sent the president of the Central Bank of Ecuador to, uh, with a delegation to Iran to negotiate which bank they would, with, with whom they would have correspondent relationships. On their way there, they stopped in Russia on the, uh, the first stop and opened an account in one of the few Russian, one the, a Russian bank that maintains correspondent banking relationships with Iran. So therefore, you could have uh, interbank uh, transfers without registering through the SWIFT system. Then they go down and they, they negotiate with the Iranian banks. There's communications from the people saying, on the delegation saying, these are all sanctioned banks. Is it okay? And the Ecuadorian government says, yes, go ahead. Well, um, are, are there policies that we could implement to, to better prevent this from happening? 
Absolutely. I think that one of the things you're seeing now in the construct I describe in Central America, where you have literally billions of unexplained dollars washing through banks that have regular correspondent relationships with the United States, uh, there would be multiple things which Dr. Asher led on, uh, on uh, the Lebanese Canadian Bank type thing. The Chairman's first question was, in Latin America, what would that, would those joint task force be, be good? Those guys were looking at pocket litter and different things and did very well in what they did. What we're looking at now is state-run banking systems where we have multiple banks in Central America that are growing exponentially with no rational uh, explanation for that. We have banks in Panama that are doing exactly the same thing. W would, would any measures we take, though, be moot? by a lifting of sanctions uh, with respect to Iran's banks? Um, I think that it could, I think it would make it much more difficult. I think that once, once the, the, un, the sanctions, is, uh, as Selena said, once the sanctions are lifted, the snapback is not going to be very rapid or, or nearly as forceful as the initial sanctions. Well, let, let me bring the Professor in for a minute there, because in your testimony, uh, um, one of the measures that, that you identified to counter these illicit networks were to maintain a vigorous designation and sanctions regime against state sponsors of terrorism foreign terrorist organizations, transnational criminal organizations, foreign narcotics kingpins, and specially designated nationals. Um, you know, I've contended that the, the sanctions regime in place that we, with, with Iran today is justified completely on the fact that they've been exporting terror for, for decades, responsible for hundreds of American deaths since 19, 1980. Well, you go back to, 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 to the rescue attempt. Uh, um, and the people we lost there, and then go through the list of, uh, uh, of, uh, of what they've been doing, including the killing of hundreds of our soldiers in Iraq. Uh, uh, that alone justifies the sanctions regime uh, with, uh, without regard to the nuclear program they have. Uh, I guess my question, Dr. Asher, Professor, if you could address whether you think if we lift these sanctions on Iran, will we see more terror financing coming from Iran? It's one of the things that's actually limited them from supporting Hezbollah as the current as, sanctions have. Right, the current sanctions have. So if you think about it, if that's the measure, and they're actually going to alleviate a lot of the economic stress that the country that is a state sponsor um, is actually, um, it's a question of we have been able to basically make their pockets smaller, right, as a global sanctions regime. And more importantly, the question is, what are they going to use with all the income they're going to have once they re-enter the global marketplace, whether it's financial as well as the import and export and trade? And there are more than enough other countries that are interested in doing business um, with Iran. Um, and unfortunately, that's the downside of globalization, which I also wrote about in my testimony, as we've benefited tremendously from a productive and interconnected world. Unfortunately, the terrorists and the criminals are taking the same advantages. I think my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony and your work in this field. We recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the panel for participating. Uh, Dr. Asher, reflect for me on, uh, you know, when we put pressure on particularly developed countries and through the financial process, through the Patriot Act, we, we squeeze legitimate users and illegitimate users out of those marketplaces, whether it's the U.K. banking system or the American banking system. And MLATs have been a, a, a big, important tool that we've had diplomatically, uh, whether it's uh, finding uh, Noriega's assets or uh, other players around the world. What can we do uh, in that arena? Can we uh, expand the MLAT process? Can we amend it? Is there a mini MLAT that we could use with countries that we don't have a full treaty with? Would you expand on that for a minute? I think it's a really interesting question because, you know, we. Uh, we haven't really utilized, uh, outside of the world of just straight-up drug trafficking, uh, the MLAT process of asset forfeiture uh, that effectively. I mean, uh, something I have advocated against uh, both ISIL and Hezbollah is the use of, uh, of RICO, which is a has tr huge transnational resonance uh, uh, against terrorist organizations as organized criminal entities, because, you know, terrorism is a spe specified unlawful act, uh, SUA under the law. So if you engage in more than two SUAs that are uh, allowed under RICO, you are engaged in a criminal conspiracy um, that can be prosecuted. And the thing about RICO and the way it relates to asset forfeiture is you can charge anyone. Like if you're an ISIL and you say, I'm an ISIL member or I'm an Al-Qaeda member, a lot of people want to brag about it, you're charged. 
technically. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty interesting tool. But you can moreover go after their money. So if we find that there's a fun foundation in a far-flung you know, land in, let's say, even a country that doesn't have an MLAT with us or doesn't honor it, Lebanon, for example, uh, we found uh, $150 million of the proceeds of the, of the forced sale, basically, it was in bankruptcy of the Lebanese Canadian Bank in a bank called Bank Lebano France. Um, they, they put the money in that. Uh, it was apparently Hezbollah's money. Um, well, under our law, we have a section thing, a law called the Section 981K of the uh, Title 18 that allows substitute assets to be confiscated where the U.S. government can't actually reach those assets. So even though we didn't have an MLAT with Lebanon, and it would have been better, I guess, if we did, we were able to freeze the money in the correspondent bank account of Lebano France. It was the proceeds of the Department of Justice was able to freeze, not me, uh, uh, and uh, forfeit ultimately $102 million of Hezbollah's money uh, without actually going to Lebanon. So, of course, if we have MLATs, which we should use strategically more effectively for asset forfeiture, it'll be exponentially more effective. But even where we don't have it, we have legal tools that can be useful. Uh, the key is we've got to deprive financial assets from our adversaries' pockets. Thank you. Mr. Barrett, is there a formalized model you can see in this charitable arena where uh, you've seen it uh, maybe a best practice where through either forced uh, disclosure of legitimate charities uh, to warn potential donors that uh, they actually have a record of bad acting through the file of their 990 report with the IRS if it's a U.S. Uh, charity, or is there a way to formalize a receipt of remittances in a, in a foreign country like Somalia that might work, that would be a way to better monitor those flows? Do you have further opinion on that? Well, I think you're right. I think public awareness is, is enormously important, and, and in, indeed the public who are donating to charities have a responsibility also to know how the charities are going to spend that money. And uh, there are regulations which have developed over the years, best practices, as you say, uh, in this country, in the United Kingdom as well, which I think uh, in require the registration of charities and the auditing of their accounts with much more detailed scrutiny than there has been in the past. And I think that is having a real effect. I think there are many fewer charities now which can be found to be funding terrorism in uh, jurisdictions where the law is applied properly and, and, and fully. Uh, and on remittances too, I think that there's a mistake often made that Hawaladas somehow are prepared to turn a blind eye to transactions which banks might otherwise stop. But in fact, Hawaladas have to know their customers even more than banks because of course it is based entirely on trust rather than on a purely commercial basis. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, calling this important hearing and, and exploring and, and learning more about the, the dangerous nexus between uh, terrorism and, um, and criminal organizations. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in whether or not there is substantial evidence of U.S.-based criminal organizations um, that have partnered with um, uh, Islamic terrorist organizations, and, and, w and what is the extent of the nexus between, well, we've, we've heard about international drug cartels involvement in partnerships uh, with terror organizations, but uh, to what extent are American-based, U.S.-based um, criminal organizations affiliated with um, uh, Islamic terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, like ISIL, for anyone? I, th I think that there are times when you see U.S.-based uh, criminal organizations overlapping tangentially in the drug trade with Hezbollah activities. I'm not aware of any, th any systemic or systematic or, or larger scale um, U.S. criminal organizations. I think that's the line that most people won't cross because I think the price would be, uh, would be very, very high for them and they're, they're aware of that. I think criminal organizations are largely very rational actors and when the price they would pay would be that high and the profit would probably, they don't need those groups to do what they want to do, particularly in drug trafficking, that I, I'm not aware of that on any significant scale. Just say briefly that it, the, you know, the Sinaloa drug cartel is not based in the United States, it derives a lot of income from the United States. Uh, 
the Mejia, Mejia Salazar cartel, which is supporting Sinaloa, but it's basically Pablo Escobar's you know, empire still living on, um, is uh, exporting massive amounts of cocaine to the United States uh, in partnership with Sinaloa, uh, and so they're earning a lot of income here. Um, in both cases, there's definitely a partnership going on with Lebanese Hezbollah, especially the darkest side of Hezbollah. I mean, in, in my work uh, personally, I can attest to that in front of you. Uh, that we've seen it, uh, and, and you know, hopefully someday it's going to get prosecuted in criminal court. Um, this confluence between these major cartels and, and criminal states, which Doug has done a great job pointing out, uh, like Venezuela, uh, and organizations like Lebanese Hezbollah, is really actually almost out of control. Well, let, me, let me turn to ISIL for just a minute. Um, we know from your testimony and from previous hearings that um, uh, the sources of, of ISIL funds are predominantly um, in oil and, and the looting of the banks from Mosul and, and kidnappings and, and ransom and the like. To what extent does the Islamic State have access uh, and participate in the international financial system banking? Um, and, uh, what it to, and what could um, American policymakers do to disrupt um, uh, the Islamic State's access to uh, 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 financial institutions? Yeah, I think that's really a, an excellent question and, and one I think that is puzzling many experts who look at ISIL. But the, the fact of the matter, I think, is most of the money is a you know, sort of cash-based economy and a self-generating economy and that the money circulates within the territories occupied by ISIL. Uh, insofar as money is coming from the outside, it does seem to come into ISIL-controlled territory in cash rather than anything else. But I think increasingly we will see the sort of transfer of money through the Internet, which is becoming more common elsewhere. And so people who want to make donations will be able to send it to a bank, probably in Turkey or in parts of the, uh, Syria and Iraq, which are not controlled by ISIL, but it will be cashed in then and brought over the over the border. So there will be some sort of interaction with the international So, so um, Section 311 there becomes, uh, is, is Section 311 the best tool available uh, to the United States to disrupt those, um, uh, those um, banking activities? Well, I would say that the best tool really is to gather intelligence on, on how that is happening and then deal with the individual cases as they come up. I think a blanket approach can be very difficult when you look at the just sort of variety that may be available and uh, the fact that the pre predominantly the cash will come into that territory uh, in, in physical form rather than electronic form. Well, my time is about ready to expire, but if, if any of you could just offer uh, an opinion on what is the single most important policy change that this Congress could enact that would disrupt uh, terrorists' access to criminal uh, organizations. Is there any one uh, recommendation that you would highlight? I think the Bank Secrecy Act of 1971 needs to be fully revived, revised. I think we need to update it. I think there's way too much money being spent on unsuccessful attempts by banks to try to limit terrorism financing and financial crime. Uh, and we're not focused on the most important things. There's a, there's a huge overregulation of the financial system in this area. I mean, I'm one of the guys who's pioneered this stuff, but I will admit it, it's not working. And that's really why I came before you today. Um, we could do a much better job with less, uh, less cost uh, to our financial institutions if we just focused on the problem actors. Um, there's not that many drug cartels in the world. Our financial institutions need to be told by the federal government who's in the cartel, what they're doing. They need to be given some sort of watch list information like we do with uh, transportation companies. The airlines know if some terrorist gets on the airplane. Why don't we tell the banks that they're banking with some terrorists? Thank you. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's just so many things we'd like to know in, in this, and when we have five minutes, we try to do it very quickly. Can I walk through just a scenario, scenario because I'm trying to also understand flow and also cost, discounts. Um, a drug cartel sells its illicit products in North America. First, how does it get the cash back? Um, across the border? Is it converting it to gold? Is it, converting, is it carrying suitcases of cash? Um, Ms. Farrar, how, how are they getting it to Central America first? What would your opinion be? And then I'm going to ask um, if they end up in Ecuador, um, what's, 
what are they being charged? Is there, what's the cost of money laundering? So walk me through a couple of these steps. Uh, thank you. I think in on the drug trade, a lot of the money goes back uh, in bulk cash, and a lot of it goes back in wire transfers and, and bank transfers into uh, Central America. Uh, the cost is generally about 17 to 22 percent. There are banks in Central America where if you deposit over a certain amount of money, generally in the neighborhood of three or four million dollars, and pay the 17 percent, they will provide you with a history of justification of that money. In other words, they'll create all the, your tax records, all your employment records, everything, so that that money is now untraceable as, as drug money. It's one of the full services uh, that, that some of the banks are offering. Ms. Farr, how much of that do you think is going to a spiff to some of the government leaders? In the, uh, the drug? Uh, uh, of that, okay, let's say I just spent 22% um, to wash my couple million right. dollars of illicit cocaine money right. that's come back into the country. The government has created a charter um, to allow me to have access to this bank. What's that president, what's that administration, what's that government taking out of that? Well, I think you see right now the Vice President of Guatemala just resigned, who was involved, who's private secretary, and I, I believe she personally was involved in a really lucrative scheme where uh, there were some banks involved and also largely to avoid uh, taxes coming across the board, uh, the customs taxes. Um, and it gets, because as the states have criminalized, it becomes a state operation to run that state. They, they end up paying a lot. I, I don't know the exact percentages. I know that in some cases the government will tell uh, government officials officials will take up to half of what, of what comes out of there. You look at some of the cases that have been prosecuted, like former President Portillo in Guatemala, who ran and racked up uh, multi-hundred millions of dollars. You have former President uh, Paco Flores in El Salvador, who's we, who we was charged with uh, $200 million. You have a for another former President of El Salvador whose own party investigation showed he had, he had made $450 million. So somebody well, Don't we have investigations going on right now in Panama and others in regards to certain issues? There are, I think that uh, what, uh, what uh, David Ashford said is true. You have a lot of really good, smart people looking at this, operating in very, with, in severe resource constraints. And when I talk, uh, you have, the, for example, the case of Banco de Andorra, which was a 311 designation, which collapsed one of the major money laundering uh, operations just a, a couple months ago. Uh, they had three branches operating in Panama. And in that branch, we had at least $2 billion from the Venezuelan uh, oil company and many uh, in Russian organized crime, China's organized crime, mm -hmm. et cetera. Okay. When you go to talk to these people, excuse me, let me just finish this thought. When you go to talk to the authorities, deal with this, they simply don't have the resources to reach out and do all of that stuff. Say, this is great. There's great information. We would like to help. We have three people to look at 45 cases, and they a lot get dropped. A look, lot's get it, dropped. About three weeks ago, I was actually in Panama, sat down with a parliamentarian, not from Panama, but from one of the countries you've mentioned, and he swears that he actually sat there and watched the check from um, ultimately Iran um, being deposited and has tried to speak about it publicly and has made very, very little progress. Um, Dr. Asher, um, walk me through, because I'm trying to get my head around how formalized this is. We had a hearing a couple years ago that actually talked about that in Venezuela, there almost was a shopping list of your price for if you're washing $100 U.S. currency, you sort of pay this, 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 and this, and here's how it breaks out. I mean, is it almost that formalized it's national policy? It's called a criminal state. I mean, it's, a, it's crime being carried out as an act of national policy to benefit the leaders of that regime. You know, and they can use it. No surprise there's money in the oil uh, accounts. You know, how do you get money from the United States? You were asking, or, or, or the Congressman Barr, I think, was asking earlier about how do you get the money from the U.S. Well, I can't prove it, but there's been way too many cases where you see these oil companies, uh, uh, in, you know, for countries like Venezuela, showing up in law enforcement cases related to the m movement of funds. You ever heard of Sitgo? Who knows what's going on with these things? I have no idea at all if any of these companies are involved. But when you read the law enforcement cases, they seem that things pop up like PDVSA and, you know, I mean, there has to be something going on with the use of uh, formalized transactions and trade with a lot of these states. And it is concerning uh, from my think tank perspective uh, that we are doing perilously little to try to police it because they are being accorded the privileges of governments 
even if they are engaged in criminal activity. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you for the time. Thank you for letting me go, go a little over. For many of us, we would love to see some of the charting to understand the movement between bad actors in governments, bad actors in business, and just plain old bad actors, and, and see that flow chart. I thank the gentleman. Uh, without objection, we will proceed to a second round of questions, if any member wishes to be recognized. Recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy. I appreciate the courtesy of each of you all. When there is a settlement with a bank in, related to their being complicit in money laundering, what happens with the proceeds of those of those settlement funds? And could those funds be used for counterterrorism efforts? And how could we designate that? Who would like to take that? It's an open question. Well, the U.S. Marshals actually manages all the assets that are um, seized. So there's freezing, which you're very familiar with, but then there's the actual seizure of assets. This has probably been much more popularized through movies that kind of look at the DEA and their raids and going after cartels. The question then is, it's then divided um, among the different agencies that were um, involved in that actual operation. Um, and it's actually a very interesting U.S. model that we're exporting um, to other partner nations who are looking at asset forfeiture um, as a very useful tool. There are two things that they say in Mexico that the cartel leaders are worried about. Um, extradition to a solitary cell without a cell phone into the United States, and then more importantly, the actual expropriation of their funds, that their children will live less luxurious a life than themselves. Um, I think, in, uh, and I've actually advocated that in the actual seizure of those funds, but more importantly, the fines that are levied to banks and institutions that are violating uh, known uh, sanctions regimes and laundering money, there should be a portion dedicated to actually helping those who are actually been involved in uncovering and then more importantly investigating and prosecuting these crimes. I think you've heard so much about um, how within the U.S. government there are really fantastic experts and analysts who are doing this, but because of the shortages of financial and more importantly human resources, and unfortunately too the fact that many of our best experts are actually leaving and going to the private sector, um, we need to really work on capacity building within the U.S. government for combating terrorism, crime, and corruption, particularly through that financial lens. Agree. I mean, resources are critical, and they we're talking of hundreds of millions and you know, billions of dollars. And the allocation of those funds, it seems to me, in uh, advancing our counterterrorism efforts would be very important. Dr. Asher, did you want to make I mean, a Having contributed probably a few hundred million dollars to the asset forfeiture fund over the years through efforts I've been involved in, I always wonder whatever happens to the money. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I, mean, you know, I mean, yes, uh, there, it, you know, we have these several billion dollar pots that are used, but far too little that is allowed to be used proactively, for example. Now, this is a very controversial issue, I know, on the, on the Hill here, and I, I respect members' opinions on this. Um, this whole fast and furious fiasco is something that we will always live to regret. I have no idea how something like that could happen. But the use of money as a tool to do sting operations, if they, you know, as they exist, is, is indispensable. We've got to put some money on the table in law enforcement to be able to interact with, no kidding, transnational organized crime groups with credibility. Undercover operations are critical. The asset forfeiture funds are critical. But there is a tiny amount, frankly, allowed to be used for any sort of proactive approach which paralyzes the effectiveness of our law enforcement organizations um, uh, against them. And I think that, you know, so it's not just the asset forfeiture funds themselves not being used for increasing asset forfeiture, uh, uh, and, and there's insufficiency there, it's how they're being used. I mean, I think we've got to get much more aggressive, like we were in the 1980s and 90s against the Colombian cartels, largely because people are getting shot left, right, and center in the streets of Miami. Thank you. For the comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up. There's so many members of the House and Senate that are so concerned about the Iranian negotiations that are underway between the administration and, and uh, Iran. And uh, when we had our last hearing, so many of us were, I think, uh, shocked at the magnitude of uh, money that would flow back to Iran were the uh, proposed uh, treaty to be successful. $50 billion signing bonus and then the freeing up of 
uh, cash in the uh, accounts that had been frozen, and then, of course, the flow, as was noted uh, by the professor, of uh, future trade capability. You know, in your role of, of interdicting terror financing and stopping the expansion of terrorism, how would you rank that 100 plus $120 billion that may flow to Iran uh, if this treaty proceeds? I mean, if one is uh, of low importance to our national security and the ability to stop the expansion of terror finance, and 10 is critical, very important, how would each of you rank the freeing up of that $120 billion? We'll start with Dr. Asher and just let each of you uh, rank. Give me a number. I, I might, I'll give you a rank. I don't think it's uh, 10. Yeah. Uh, it may be 5, okay. maybe 3. But the big thing is it's re Iran's revolutionary regime and its externalization of the regime of that revolution, which is its top priority as a policy that is the problem. When we went to the North Korea Six Party Talks, we should have been focused not just on the fact they were exporting a nuclear reactor to Syria, which probably had something to do with the Iranians, right in the, under our feet, but we also should have been focused on the fact the North Korean regime was not agreeing to negotiate about its destiny as a regime. Its whole orientation was against our existence. That's the problem with the Iranians. Now, maybe there's something going on where they're going to change that. I hope so. But that, to me, is the problem that concerns me, is they're inimically opposed to us, and it's their national ideology as a state. Yes, I think that Iran, like all nations, operates in its own best interests, and uh, it, it, it will identify those best interests in different ways according to the context of the international community around it. Um, sure, you know, Iran, if it had more money, might fund actors that the United States and its allies would not uh, like to see better funded. Uh, at the moment, of course, Iran is providing a huge amount of money to Syria, for example, to prop up the Assad regime. Um, it's paying for various uh, militia in Iraq, which, on the other hand, are probably the most effective forces against ISIL. And I think that the, the, the main way of making sure that that additional money will not be used in ways that, 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 that we wouldn't like uh, is to try to bring Iran much more into the international community so they identify their interests alongside everybody else's rather than being the sort of outlier who's always trying to sort of find advantage. And that, of course, comes back to the fundamental problems in the Middle East of sectarianism, the competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and many, many other complex questions. Well, I agree with, uh, with David Asher. One of the late uh, prosecutor, Alberto Nisman, in, in Argentina was the one who pointed out to me when we were talking about Iran in Latin America, he said, have you ever read the Iranian Constitution? And I said, you know, frankly, no. Uh, and he said, read the preamble to the Iranian Constitution in their official translation. And it is state policy to expand using the Revolutionary Armed Guard as the armed vanguard of spreading jihad around the world and world conquest. That's written into their constitution. So I, I agree with David that there is a fundamental nature of the Iranian regime is something that allowing fungible money into their system will almost inevitably point toward much more aggressive uh, action outside, including, including terrorism, because that is their core underlying belief, which they acknowledge and write about extensively. I think it's a great concern. Here in the United States, we focus primarily on the nuclear deal, when at the same time, a lot of our Arab allies are much more focused on Iranian expansionism. And more importantly, they talk about the revival of a Persian empire. You've actually seen now the influence of Iran in four major capitals. They call it the Shia Crescent, and um, several of our Arab Gulf state um, allies are worried about being, becoming a Shia circle. So you have basically control or influence in Baghdad, in, um, in uh, Lebanon, in Syria, and sadly what you're seeing devolve in Yemen. So those, it's not even a question of a state sponsor of terrorism, it's this question about Iranian hegemony um, in the Middle East which has, it's so complex because of the religious angle as well as the historical rivalries. It's something I think that we're not really covering here in the press as much. Since we're so focused on the Iran nuclear deal, we're not looking at the geopolitical aspirations of Iran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your testimony. I have been listening uh, very attentively uh, in my office uh, uh, at your testimony. 
And uh, let me just ask a first a, a few questions, because my focus has been uh, on this uh, committee, what we can do in Congress uh, to, uh, to make sure that we are not allowing this, uh, the uh, Internet and others to, to facilitate anti-money money laundering, et cetera. So, Mr. Asher, I guess I'll ask you the first question. I think that in your testimony, uh, you mentioned that Congress should amend the Bank Secrecy Act to facilitate anti-money laundering data sharing among banks. Now, the issue that we recently had to vote, you know, is that there's a general concern among Americans about personal information being widely available uh, to a range of institutions with little knowledge about how that information is being used. So, I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, this conflict and how Congress should proceed with improving the Bank Secrecy Act while also preserving the individual's human rights to privacy, the debate that we have going on in Congress right now. That's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it. Um, look, uh, bank secrecy, uh, the Bank Secrecy Act was actually not passed to protect bank secrets it was, or privacy. It was designed to stop any money laundering in 1971. They just changed the name because of concerns. I'm concerned as a private American citizen about information, about uh, you know, personal information being divulged. But the, unfortunately, the sort of cat's out of the bag as we look at the credit rating bureaus and everything else. The amount of data that like an Experian or someone will have about any of us is, is, is almost ridiculous. Uh, um, uh, but it's ironic, though, that banks uh, are, are reticent to share data with other banks, even though it's allowed under the USA Patriot Act, Section 314B. Uh, uh, you can share banks, and A or B, I can't remember which one. Uh, banks can share AML, anti-money laundering data with each other, but they can't pool it. If you could pool it, if you could do sort of the Visa or MasterCard processing of anti-money laundering data, you would see massive schemes uh, that could be stopped by uh, banks at a relatively low cost. Because you'd see that, you know, this guy just opened an account at this bank in whatever city, and then at this bank in this city, and you know, they're, they're smurfing the system, they're setting up a money laundering network. But right now, no one can see that. So sharing the data would not only reduce costs dramatically for the banking uh, system, it would improve effectiveness. I don't, you know, they'd still be uh, obliged to not share that data with anyone outside of, you know, official channels. They, they couldn't uh, provide it to, uh, the, you know, they'd just be sharing with each other. They're allowed to do that. So you, it's not going to get divulged any more than it already is being divulged. So I'm not that concerned. I just think, you know, economy of scale does help in, in, in trying to stop things from occurring. It also can bring down costs. Moreover, a consortium could be uh, in a position to receive watch list data, even classified data from, a, from the U.S. government. And I think we need to consider providing that. We provide it again to our air, airplane, airlines and shipping lines. If we think there's a Maersk uh, ship that's containing a container full of, uh, um, let's say, you know, some weapons uh, coming in the United States, we're going to tell Maersk, there's a container, you got to uh, inspect it. Do we tell the banks that they're doing business with uh, drug traffickers or Hezbollah? No. Only through public uh, uh, divulsions. And I think we should keep these things, we don't need to publicly uh, uh, approach these issues uh, and tell the terrorists that we're looking at them. We can we, provide. But you know them. that that debate is going on. Are we really I do, gonna, I uh, do, and I think, but I think it's a healthy debate, and I am concerned. But I don't think, I don't think if this system's done right, it's not going to lead to any more divulsion of, of private information than is occurring already. In fact, it, it, we, it just might be much more effective. I'm just running out of time, and I would like to have this debate more and more. But again, I, again, I'm trying to figure out what we can do as a committee. Let me jump to Mr. Barrett real quick because I think that you stated in your testimony that corruption along with other forms of poor governance, particularly in the delivery of justice, is possibly the most significant driver of terrorism in the world today. So I was asking, want to know maybe, and you can elaborate on what role that uh, the Financial Services Committee, with our oversight authority of international monetary organizations, what role can we play and better ensuring governance in nations struggling with terrorist organizations? Well, I think, uh, did, was that for? Well, go ahead. No, no, whoever, go ahead. Well, I think that what you're doing is absolutely right, because I think that as corruption, corrupt officials, criminality and so on, the lack of the rule of law is such a driver of terrorism in these areas where essentially the people are completely dissatisfied with, with what's provided by government, the more you can uh, sanction those individuals, those government leaders and others who are involved in the corrupt practices and uh, in the uh, you know, financial skullduggery that goes on, 
um, in the general criminal world, then the less, uh, obviously, uh, obviously the less dissatisfied people will be if they see justice being served at least in another jurisdiction, even if not in their own, that will uh, be very encouraging to them. So I think that it has a knock-on effect on the terrorist problem. Gentlemen's time has expired. Again, I'd like to thank the witnesses for their testimony and their time here today and for the significant expertise that you've shared with the task force. We all, we all appreciate that. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned.